It was all a lie, a big, beautiful lie. They told you to trust them and everything would be okay. But behind the facade, there were no golden plates, no priesthood authority, no real prophets, just lies. You know that you can no longer believe them, so who do you believe? They taught you that if Mormonism wasn't true, atheism was your only option. Though many former Mormons try to convince themselves there is no God, atheism is just another lie. We address it in a separate video and show the foolishness of how it pretends to find meaning and value in a universe that is supposed to be devoid of purpose. But if Mormonism and atheism are both lies, who do you believe? It helps if you go back and recognize the fundamental lie of Mormonism. In spite of all their emotion and sentimentality, in spite of how big they make his name on their signs, their religion was never about Jesus Christ. It was about a false prophet who used a butchered Bible, a counterfeit Christ, and a false church as props for his con game. In theory, Mormons believe the Bible is the Word of God. They point you to the Epistle of James, chapter 1, verse 5. But then, instead of reading the rest of the Bible, they tell you to pray for a newer and better revelation, a burning in your bosom that testifies that the Book of Mormon is true. The funny thing is that the Bible, the burning in your bosom, and the Book of Mormon are then trumped by the revelations of those higher up in the church. For all the nice things LDS say about the prophets and apostles of the Bible, Mormonism was never about them. It was never about the Jesus they revealed, but about a Jesus edited and redefined by the president of the Mormon church. The living prophet is more vital to us than the standard works. Beware of those who would pit a dead prophet against the living prophets, for the living prophets always take precedence. You know that Mormonism is a lie, so let's go back and re-examine how you can know who to believe. Some people try to hold on to the Book of Mormon as if it's more trustworthy than Joseph Smith. Others reject it, but trust their hearts to lead them into truth. They fail to recognize it was their hearts that led them into Mormonism. Our plea is to roll everything back to the Bible, and instead of reading only James 1.5, keep reading. Don't let Mormonism's lies cause you to reject the Bible. They never really believed it. It was only a prop. The presence of counterfeits doesn't mean there isn't a genuine. Unlike the Mormon prophets, the biblical ones were actually gifted by God to perform miracles far more significant than birds eating crickets. Their prophecies were also fulfilled with a specificity never found in Mormonism. The biblical apostles healed the sick and raised the dead. They didn't do this behind closed doors, but in the view of even their critics. So their authority was clearly seen to be from God. They pointed to a Jesus radically different from the Jesus of Mormonism. And if you only knew him, you would see that he is worthy of your trust. The problem is that former Mormons have a problem trusting the Bible to reveal him. From your youth, you were taught not to look to any book, but to your heart and to your leaders to really know truth. The LDS claimed the Book of Mormon is the most perfect book in the world. But nowhere does it teach much of what defines their faith. Celestial marriage and exaltation are found nowhere in its pages, nor the word of wisdom, baptism for the dead, an endorsement of plural marriage, or the idea of a multitude of gods. In their view, scriptures are almost incidental to the knowledge of the truth. Isn't it a little strange that there's no book of Adam or Enoch or Noah? No book of Andrew, Philip, or Nathaniel. Can it be that the books in our present Bible are there more by historical accident than by divine destiny? 
King David certainly did not share Bruce McConkie's low view of the Bible. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Jesus declared the scriptures to be the authoritative word of God. Our Creator has spoken, and His words have been written down so they can be objectively known and passed down to future generations. No prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Jesus and his apostles invited others to search the Scriptures in order to validate what they were saying, because hundreds of prophecies over thousands of years demonstrated that Jesus was the promised Messiah. The Scriptures don't simply contain truth. They are God's Word, the standard by which all the claims of men are to be measured. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the Word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. The LDS tests Scriptures based on how they fit with what the current prophet is teaching. God says we should test them by the Scriptures. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, Let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. The teachings of the real prophets and apostles presented the same God and the same unfolding gospel over the course of one and a half millennia. Joseph Smith couldn't tell the same story over the course of 14 years. According to the real apostles of Jesus, The way of knowing truth today isn't a burning in your bosom or a prophet who speaks contrary to the Bible, but the Holy Spirit speaking by and with the Scriptures in your heart. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, throughly furnished unto all good works. The Greek word translated inspiration of God is theonoustos. A more literal translation is that the Scriptures are God-breathed. The Scriptures were not dictated but they were directly inspired by God's Spirit speaking through the writer. God has not left us to be tossed about by our own deceitful hearts or by the claims of charlatans. He has spoken through the true prophets and apostles and had those words written down for clarity and their preservation. Though Paul tells us the Scriptures are able to make us wise, few former Mormons will spend much time studying them. They've been convinced they know far more about the Bible than they really do, and they've been fed a steady stream of lies about it. You know the Mormons lied about everything else. Let's peel back their falsehoods about the Bible and then look at what it says about the real Jesus.
The LDS Church was built on the claim that there are many lost books of the Bible. By claiming that the scriptures are incomplete, the Mormons make them inadequate and open the door for their modern prophet. Where we wonder are the various lost books, such as the book of Gad, the seer, all mentioned with approval in the Bible itself. Just because the Bible includes references to other books doesn't mean it is incomplete. In Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul quotes to the Athenians from their poet Eratus. This doesn't mean that Eratus was speaking for God, but only that he had written something that would help the Athenians understand what God was saying through Paul. Eratus was a pagan poet. Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ. The Bible refers to books that give additional details about historical events. This doesn't mean they're any more the Word of God than the poetry of Eratus. The Moabites recorded the same events of 2 Kings 3 on a stele set up shortly after the battle, around 840 years before Christ. Though it is informative and supports much of what we read in the Bible, it is written from an idolatrous perspective and is not a lost book of the Bible. It is simply an uninspired account of the same historical event. The Mormons hurl all sorts of attacks at the Bible, hoping something will hit its target. Beyond raising questions about books that no longer exist, the LDS also seek to confuse you over what existing books should be included in the Bible. They love to point to Martin Luther having questions about whether the epistle of James and the book of Revelation belonged in the Bible. Like former Mormons, Luther was having to sort through all the lies he had been told. Though he questioned these books, he never rejected them and included them in his translation of the Bible into German. Since Mormons do not see any scripture as really authoritative, they try to bury the Bible in a sea of other supposed scriptures, beginning with the Apocrypha. Roman Catholics and the Orthodox churches tend to accept the Apocrypha as canonical, books included in their Bibles, but left out of most Protestant Bibles, including the current King James Version. The Apocrypha is a collection of Jewish writings made after the close of the Old Testament and before the birth of Christ. The Jews valued them for their history and appended them to the Septuagint, but never considered them the Word of God. Though organized slightly differently, the Hebrew Bible and the Protestant Old Testament are identical in their contents. Jesus and the apostles clearly recognized the books of the Hebrew Bible, citing them hundreds of times and declaring them the Word of God. Nowhere did they ever refer to anything in the Apocrypha as the Word of God. Historically, even Roman Catholic popes such as Gregory the Great were clear that the Apocrypha should not be seen as part of the biblical canon. The Roman Catholic Council of Trent only declared the Apocrypha to be part of the Bible because Protestant reformers had shown that the Catholic teaching of purgatory was a medieval invention and completely unbiblical. Rather than let the Scriptures correct their errors, the Roman Church sought to expand the Bible to fit their doctrine. The Apocrypha contains Second Maccabees, in which there is a prayer for the souls of the dead. Though these dead had committed mortal sins that would be unforgivable in Catholic teaching, the Council of Trent embraced the Apocrypha as giving them at least some support for their dogma. Like the Mormons, Roman Catholics' ultimate authority is not any prophet or apostle of the Bible, but a man who claims to speak for God and contradicts the Bible. LDS are not content to add the Apocrypha and their own scriptures to the Bible. They also seek to bury it under countless others so that no scripture is seen as having greater authority than their prophet. Speaking of the Nag Hammadi Library, BYU professor Hugh Nibley said, Beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained everything to them out of the scriptures. And then it tells us their eyes were open, they began to understand. We don't have a word of what he told them after the 40 days. Now all these newly discovered writings claim to be that teaching. Are they genuine or aren't they? Well, for one thing, they hang together. They hang together beautifully. They give a very consistent picture of the gospel. For another thing, nobody would ever have invented them. These aren't odds and ends in the manner of the Gnostics when they take tatters of Oriental philosophy and everything and throw them together into patchwork systems. 
This is a very consistent gospel, exactly as we have it ourselves. Would you like to hear some selections from these writings that so impressed Nibley? Jesus said, The kingdom of the Father is like a certain man who wanted to kill a powerful man. In his own house, he drew his sword and stuck it into the wall in order to find out whether his hand could carry through. Then he slew the powerful man. Jesus said, He who will drink from my mouth will become like me. I myself shall become he, and the things that are hidden will be revealed to him. Simon Peter said to him, Let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Hugh Nibley actually claimed these writings came from the time of the apostles and should be used to reshape Christianity. The reality is that like the Book of Mormon, they are anachronistic counterfeits. They were written long after the deaths of the apostles and were completely contrary to their known writings. They presented a completely different God and a completely different gospel from both the Old Testament and the real apostles. Just as people in the 19th century pointed out that the Book of Mormon was a counterfeit, Christian leaders in the 2nd century, such as Irenaeus, responded to these Gnostic forgeries. Irenaeus had been taught by Polycarp, who had been personally discipled by the Apostle John. The church knew what the apostles had taught and had that teaching in black and white directly from their pens. They recognized these counterfeits for what they were. Imagine someone putting forth a supposedly lost book by Joseph Smith in 1970, in which Smith claimed his true religion was Hinduism. The LDS prophet in 1970 was Joseph Fielding Smith. Besides his own father, he grew up knowing John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, and Lorenzo Snow, men who had all known Joseph Smith personally. Joseph Fielding Smith would have pronounced such a book to be an obvious fraud. But Mormons hold the Bible to a very different standard. They claim that no one knew what books belonged in the Bible until church councils supposedly settled the issue hundreds of years later. Despite all their attempts to confuse, the reality is that the New Testament wasn't dug out of a hillside. It was written by apostles who were known by the churches they established. The Colossians didn't have to wonder whether Paul's letter to them was authentic. It was hand-delivered by Timothy, his fellow worker. The church at Rome didn't have to wonder whether Paul's letter to them was genuine. He later went to Rome and confirmed it. There were a few people in the early church who were unsure of the book of Revelation because they weren't well grounded in its Old Testament imagery. There were also a few of the smaller epistles that were not known to every church at first. But in terms of the four Gospels, Acts, and the letters of Paul, these were clearly recognized by the churches of the first century. Writing possibly as early as 80 AD, Clement of Rome addressed the church in Corinth and quotes from Paul's epistle to them. By 140 AD, Tatian had produced the Diatessaron, a one-volume harmony of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. None of the Gnostic Gospels were included because most had not even been written, and those that had been were known to be frauds. The actual writings of the apostles were never in serious doubt. Rather than the church defining the scriptures hundreds of years after they were written, it was the apostolic teaching recorded in the scriptures that defined the church and its faith. When the LDS can't explain away the Bible itself, they claim it has been mistranslated or its text corrupted. They give you the impression that the Bible wasn't simply copied, but translated from one language to another, to another, to another, so that the original text has been long since lost. The truth is that though the Bible has been translated into other languages, copies were also made in the original languages without translation. The Hebrew Bible today is a faithful copy of the Old Testament, and the New Testament has been faithfully copied in the original Greek. The LDS seem to have no problem translating the Book of Mormon into other languages, but they imply that translating the Bible means we can never know what it really says, even if we can go back to copies in the original languages. They also point to the fact that publishers 
have come out with several modern translations in English to cast doubt on whether any translation can be trusted. Do slightly different English translations of the same Hebrew and Greek really call into question whether the Bible can be understood? Isn't it striking that all English translations present the same condemnations of Mormonism? Besides trying to confuse you on matters of translation, the Mormons claim that the biblical text has been deliberately corrupted. The Book of Mormon tells us that after the prophets and apostles of the Bible had written the words of God, evil and unbelieving men would remove many plain and precious truths from their writings. The result was great confusion and misunderstanding concerning the Word of God. The Bible said that we must all be baptized. Unlike the Bible, which passed through generations of copyists, translators, and corrupt religionists who tampered with the text, the Book of Mormon came from writer to reader in just one inspired step of translation. There were people who tried to corrupt the Bible just as some splinter LDS groups try to add their revelations to the Doctrine and Covenants. The LDS Church has no hesitation in rejecting these alternative versions of the DNC, but they claim any obvious counterfeit or error in transcription invalidates all faithful copies of the Bible. They argue that unless God struck scribes dead when they miscopied something, the Bible can't be trusted, even if the errors or counterfeits are easily spotted. Of course, they don't hold the Book of Mormon to the same standard. So has the text of the Bible been lost in countless errors and corruptions? In 1946, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered that went back to before the time of Christ. When compared to later copies, they were nearly identical. As an example, let's look at the great messianic prophecy of Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, there was only one notable difference from the modern text, and even it really didn't affect the meaning. In verse 11, it adds light, so that it reads, He shall see light of the travail of his soul, 
and he will be satisfied. Everything that pointed to Jesus was word for word the same, except for minor stylistic differences. The Dead Sea Scrolls have demonstrated the faithful copying of the Old Testament, and the New Testament is by far the best attested text in all of antiquity. Not only do we have nearly 6,000 manuscripts in the original Greek, but we have thousands of manuscripts of very early translations into other languages. We also have over one million quotations of the New Testament in the writings of the early church authors. Even if we had nothing else, we could nearly reconstruct the whole New Testament simply from these quotes. The average manuscript evidence for a classical work of antiquity would stack about four feet high. The manuscript evidence for the New Testament would stack over one mile high. No one is claiming that there aren't manuscripts that have errors and corruptions, but they can be corrected by the massive evidence from other manuscripts. Even the most radical skeptics, such as the atheist Bart Ehrman, admits that no major doctrine is affected by textual issues. Mormonism seeks to undermine your confidence in the Bible, not because there are real issues of textual transmission, but because the Bible's unmistakable teaching contradicts their false prophets. When they point to supposed errors, they have no interest in hearing real answers to their claims. They are only seeking to create as much confusion as they can to make you despair that the Bible is reliable. Besides all these accusations, the Mormons also claim that the prophets and apostles of the Bible contradict themselves. They love to contrast Paul in Ephesians 2 with James in the second chapter of his epistle. A surface reading makes them seem contradictory, but a quick look at the context clarifies the matter. Paul is dealing with legalists, like the Mormons, who claim that they are made right with God after all they can do. He is telling them they're wrong. James is dealing with people who claim to be right with God but have no works. He is telling them they're wrong. If the Mormons bothered to read the very next verse in Ephesians, the matter would be clear. Paul agrees with James that though we are not saved by our works, good works flow from a changed heart. Another favorite you were taught as a Mormon is that Paul gives two contradictory accounts of his conversion on the Damascus Road. Mormons ignore that the passages have very different constructions in the Greek. These constructions indicate that in Acts 9, the men heard the voice but as stated in Acts 22, they did not understand what the voice was saying. Mormons aren't interested in such details, but in making as many accusations against the Bible as they can, hoping something will drive you back to their prophet and away from the Jesus of the Bible. In spite of seeing through all these lies, few former Mormons will feel inclined to really open their Bibles. They've been told over and over that there are tens of thousands of different denominations because it's so unclear. Did you notice that they didn't bother to tell you where they got their numbers? They come from the Center for the Study of Global Christianity at Gordon-Conwell Seminary. The center estimates that in 2017, there are roughly 47,000 Christian denominations in the world, but that number is not what the Mormons represent it to be. Each country in which a denomination functions is counted separately, so the numbers are grossly inflated. Roman Catholicism, which is one denomination, is counted 237 times since it exists in nearly every country and there are multiple organizations of it in some countries. Any group that claims to be Christian is counted no matter what their view of the Bible. The LDS are counted 185 times and the Jehovah's Witnesses are counted 232 times. Even if there are not tens of thousands of denominations, there are many different groups claiming to believe the Bible and yet teaching very different things. So is the Bible really that confusing? No. Very, very few of them even claim the Bible as their ultimate standard of truth. Almost all have some additional prophet who tells you the Bible needs correction or requires them to be understood. Do you remember what the Mormon church says about the Bible? They only believe it where it agrees with their living prophet. The reason they disagree with everyone else is not that the Bible is unclear, but because it's not really believed. J. 
Joseph Smith hated the God of the Bible. So he made up new scriptures and rewrote the Bible to create a God to his own liking. Instead of accepting or rejecting the biblical Jesus, Muslims, Mormons, and a host of others try to redefine him. The irony is that for all their claims that others have corrupted the Bible, they are the ones who are really doing it because they don't like what it says. They edit it to suit themselves treating it as a cafeteria where they can build a Jesus to their own liking, while leaving out the parts they prefer to ignore. While the Mormons and others use a newer New Testament to nullify the Bible, others simply twist the existing scriptures to ignore what they don't like. Since 1830, dispensationalists have been claiming every generation is the last one. They don't claim new revelations as such, just new insights into the existing scriptures that the Spirit never showed anyone before 1830. They claim the church is not an expanded Israel with Jews and Gentiles, but a dispensation that must end in failure. A remnant of the church will be raptured away so God can go back to dealing with the real Israel. Besides allowing them to fixate on Middle East politics, dispensationalism also allows them to dismiss any part of the Bible they don't like by claiming it pertains to another dispensation. The alternative to all this is called by the Latin name Sola Scriptura. Rather than changing the Bible, we seek to be changed by it because it is our ultimate standard. Instead of editing it to suit our feelings or the claims of some modern prophet, we subject them to the witness of the biblical prophets and apostles. Most of the confusion you see among professing Christians actually comes from the explicit rejection of Sola Scriptura. Like the Mormons, Pentecostals believe there was a new outpouring of the Spirit, but instead of it being in 1830, they say it was in 1906. Like the Mormons, they claim to be receiving new revelations. Some even have new prophets and apostles. And like the Mormons, their claims don't hold up very well to scrutiny. Many nominally Protestant churches think the Spirit is giving them newer and better revelations. The Bible hasn't changed, but their reading of it has. Rather than having one supposed prophet contradicting the Bible, they have many. The reality is that there are very few people who still hold to the doctrine of Sola Scriptura today in America. It's really an aloof God who sends his son to save us, sends his apostles out to share the good news orally, and then in a very illiterate world, Sinners, everything on a book very few people can read, let alone understand. Does that make any sense to you? For 1,500 years, we have people who can't read, and if they could read, they probably can't understand what they're reading, and that God has said sola scriptura from the beginning instead of sola spiritus? But my point is to show, to prove the illogical nature of the Sola Scriptura stance while simultaneously proving that Christianity has been and is entirely subjective and led of the Spirit, not the men of mortar and their authority. Does this sound familiar? It's what Joseph Smith taught. It's the burning in your bosom. The doctrine of Sola Scriptura doesn't divorce the Spirit from the Bible. But the Holy Spirit speaks by and with the Scriptures, not against them. Biblical truth is not subjective and personal, but objective and transcendent. What God says is true whether we believe it or whether we don't. Rather than establishing authoritarian rulers, Sola Scriptura actually establishes a standard by which everyone is judged, even those who claim to speak for God. Like the Mormons, Lots of people try to tack an edited Bible onto their man-made religion, but the basic message of the Bible has never been that hard to comprehend. Understanding the Word of God doesn't require special glasses or a seer stone and a hat. It simply requires dusting off your Bible, praying for God to make it clear, and reading it in context. Parts of the Bible may seem confusing, but they make sense if you remember the flow of biblical history. God has not changed, but his way of dealing with his people has. From the calling of Abraham until the coming of Christ, the church was centered on a family that God made into a nation. 
He led them out of Egypt and gave them a tabernacle, sacrifices, and ordinances. Their diet, dress, and grooming were all prescribed so that they were set apart from the nations around them. He led them into the promised land and used them to execute judgment on the Canaanites. He gave them kings and prophets who pointed to the coming of a kingdom of which all this was but a shadow. The substance behind it all was Jesus. And when he came, the shadows passed away. Now the church is no longer restricted to one nation on one corner of the map, but made up of members of every tongue, tribe, and nation around the world. The diet, dress, and grooming of Israel are no longer required, but the basic morality is. The church is still called to war, but its weapons are spiritual. The temple that had taken the place of the tabernacle gave way to a new and better temple, a spiritual one of which believers are living stones, and Jesus is the chief cornerstone. The bloody sacrifices of the old temple ended when Christ offered himself as the one whose blood could truly take away sin. Mormonism's gospel denies all of this because it denies the real work of Jesus. Mormons constructed a new temple. Instead of the sacrifices of the old temple, they invented secret ceremonies found nowhere in the Bible. They kept the shedding of blood outside their temples because they said Christ's sacrifice wasn't sufficient to cleanse from all sin. They sought to create a new nation with its own army, and they saw themselves as preparing to help in the slaughter of their enemies. All who will not hearken to the Book of Mormon shall be cut off from among the people, and that too in the day it comes forth to the Gentiles and is rejected by them. And not only does this page set the time for the overthrow of our government and all other Gentile governments on the American continent, but the way and means of this utter destruction are clearly foretold. Namely, the remnant of Jacob will go through among the Gentiles and tear them in pieces, like a lion among the flock of sheep. Their hand shall be lifted up upon their adversaries, and all enemies shall be cut off. This destruction includes an utter overthrow and desolation of all cities, forts, and strongholds, an entire annihilation of our race, except such as embrace the covenant and are numbered with Israel. Now, Mr. Sunderland, you have something definite and tangible. The time, the manner, the means, the names, the dates, and I will state as a prophecy that there will not be an unbelieving Gentile upon this continent fifty years hence. And if they are not greatly scourged and in a great measure overthrown within five or ten years from this date, then the Book of Mormon will have proved itself false. The biblical message is radically different and profoundly simple. The fall of Adam was not a triumph but a tragedy. We are sinful children of sinful parents and need to be reconciled to a holy God. We were created in the image of God, but there is something terribly broken in us. The gospel is not about proving our worthiness but about the great exchange. Jesus takes our sins upon himself so that we might receive his righteous life counted to us. The righteous suffers for the unrighteous, the worthy for the unworthy, the just for the unjust. In his crucifixion, Jesus nails our rebellious heart, our filthy past, and our poisonous life to the cross. In his resurrection, he gives us his heart, a new heart that loves him. His perfect righteousness is counted to us as our sins were counted to him, and he puts his Holy Spirit in us. The gospel isn't about learning secret handshakes or mouthing the words to the right prayer, but new birth in Jesus Christ. The gospel isn't about becoming a Mormon God, but something far, far greater. We become truly human and are adopted as children of a God beyond your wildest imagination. In the Bible, you will find a Jesus who is not our elder spirit brother, but our creator and our redeemer, the one in whose presence the holy angels had to cover their faces is the one who hung naked on a cross for his enemies. He did not die to help good people save themselves, but to bring salvation to sinful rebels as a free gift. Our plea is simple. 
read the scriptures, believe on the real Jesus, and do what he says. He calls you not to slavery, but to freedom. Freedom not just from the guilt of sin, but from its power as well. He calls you to a life of love, love for your enemies, but especially love for his people in the church. Jesus calls us to love within a covenant community of a visible church. But having been burned by Mormonism, joining a church is the last thing most former Mormons want to consider. But Mormons not only lie to you about the Bible and Jesus, but also about other churches. Fundamental to Mormonism and all Restorationism is the idea that the Christian church fell into a great apostasy and had to be restored with new prophets and new apostles. The Apostle Paul foretold a falling away, but never the total collapse Mormons want it to be. Prophets and apostles were never intended to be permanent offices in the church. They were the foundation, not the whole building. To be an apostle, you had to be a witness of Christ's resurrection. The biblical apostles also had gifts that none of their modern counterfeits possess. The reason they didn't need replacements was because their testimony to the risen Christ had been written down and preserved for future generations. When they established churches, they didn't appoint new apostles, but elders. The deaths of the original apostles didn't mark the end of the church, but a new beginning. The idea of a total apostasy makes sense if your God is an exalted man who is dependent on the free agency of other men. But that's not the God of the Bible. He is not an exalted man or one among many gods. He is the God whom the heavens of heavens can't contain. He is the God who spoke the universe into existence from nothing. He not only made it, but he rules everything in it, working all things after the counsel of his own will. When he promised the coming of Christ, it wasn't wishful thinking, but the pledge of the God outside of whose will not a sparrow falls. Mormons argue for a total apostasy by setting the bar to a level neither they nor the historic church lives up. Rather than honoring the faithfulness of the historic church, they seek to slander it. They ignore that sin has made all history messy. Cain killed Abel. God drowned everyone in the flood but Noah and his family. Despite this, sinful men didn't learn, but rebelled in the building of the Tower of Babel. When God brought Israel out of Egypt, they refused to enter the Promised Land and took up stones to kill Moses. Over and over, Israel was given to her enemies because of her sin. But God was working all of this to bring about his promises. This doesn't mean the faithful church has always been easy to see. In 1 Kings 19, Elijah is so despondent that he asked God to die. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Though Elijah despaired that any true believers were left, God had preserved to himself 7,000 men who had not worshipped Baal. God is sovereign over everything including the preservation of his people. Despite the Assyrians destroying Samaria, the Babylonians destroying the temple in Jerusalem and taking Israel into exile, despite all these things, at the appointed time Christ came, just as God promised. The Mormons would have us believe that despite all the fulfilled promises of the Old Testament, Jesus' promise failed the promise that the gates of hell would not prevail against his church. Just as in the Old Testament, sin has made church history messy. Even during the apostles' lifetimes, the churches they established wrestled with sin. Most of the New Testament epistles deal with correcting their errors. There was apostasy when Nero declared war against the church, but God preserved a remnant, just as he had done throughout history. He blessed that remnant, and within 250 years, 
Caesar would bow his knee to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Mormons try to dismiss this faithful remnant by claiming it was essentially Roman Catholic. The reality is that neither Mormonism nor Roman Catholicism is the historic faith of the church. Like Phariseeism, Roman Catholicism is a mix of the Bible with a host of man-made traditions that developed over centuries. Despite their corruptions, God has preserved a people who hear, believe, and obey His Word. To see that, it helps to go back to the Council of Nicaea. It was called by the Emperor Constantine in 325 to settle the claims of Arius that Jesus wasn't by nature equal to the Father. Arius and his defenders claimed that Jesus was of a similar essence to the Father, but not of the same essence. They were claiming that Jesus had not merely subordinated himself to the Father, but was by his very nature inferior to him. The council considered their arguments, and 316 out of 318 bishops reaffirmed the biblical teaching that Jesus is by nature equal with the Father. Mormons would have you believe that Nicene Orthodoxy then triumphed because of the support of the emperor. The reality is very different. Constantine was a politician who simply wanted these controversies ended. He initially exiled Arius and his supporters, but when they reworded their teachings and appealed to the emperor, Constantine allowed them to return and take up offices in the church again. He saw those who resisted as troublemakers and rebels. When Athanasius, the bishop of Alexandria, tried to protect the church from the Arian heresy, Constantine exiled him in 335. Two years later, the Arians found even greater support in Constantine's successor, Constantius, and effectively took over the visible church. Athanasius persevered, despite being denounced by church councils and even seeing the bishop of Rome, Pope Liberius, surrender to the Arians. Over much of 31 years he suffered exile, yet he held firm, because he knew that to be Catholic and apostolic had more to do with holding to the faith of the apostles than possession of an outward office. Athanasius stood against the world based on the clear teaching of the Bible. Our faith is right, and starts from the teaching of the apostles and tradition of the fathers being confirmed both by the New Testament and the Old. Vainly, then, do they run about with the pretext that they have demanded counsels for the faith's sake. For divine scripture is sufficient above all things. But if a counsel be needed on the point, there are the proceedings of the fathers. For the Nicene bishops did not neglect this matter but stated the doctrine so exactly that persons reading their words honestly cannot but be reminded by them of the religion towards Christ announced in divine scripture. Eventually, orthodoxy triumphed, but only because faithful men and women held to the truth of the scriptures. Despite that victory, the war continued. In the 5th century, Augustine held to the Bible's authority and stood against the Bishop of Rome in opposing the heretic Pelagius. In the 9th century, Gottschalk appealed to the Bible to denounce the errors of Pope Nicholas I, and as a consequence he died in a monastery prison. In the 12th century, Peter Waldo called people to read the Bible and reject the new papal dogma of transubstantiation, as well as purgatory. The Pope killed many of Waldo's followers, but God preserved a remnant that eventually joined with the Reformed churches that came later. In the 14th century, John Wycliffe translated the Bible into English and cited it in his opposition to the papacy, transubstantiation, and the veneration of saints. His writings encouraged John Huss in Bohemia, who was burned at the stake for teaching them. The Protestant Reformation wasn't really something new, but a long continuing struggle to read the Bible for what it really says, rather than according to some pretended prophet or pope. 
Martin Luther said, In my opinion, John has bought with his own blood the gospel which we now possess. What was new in the 16th century was the availability of the printing press. Not only did it make Bibles far more readily available, but it also allowed publication of early Christian writings. Both demonstrated that Roman Catholicism wasn't holy, Catholic, or apostolic. As with the Arians, the heretics had largely taken over the visible church, but God had preserved his remnant who held to his word in the Bible. In his final edition of the Institutes of the Christian Religion, John Calvin quoted from the early church fathers over 800 times. The scriptures alone are God-breathed and without error, but the reformers took comfort that they were reading them in the same way as faithful generations before them. Not only can the scriptures be understood, but they have been understood for a very long time. Throughout the history of the church, there have been wolves who have attacked from without and from within. To hold to the historic biblical faith often meant exile, torture, and death. But in the midst of it all were faithful shepherds seeking to feed and protect the flock. The war against historic biblical Christianity continues in our day. Mormons and a host of others try to lead you away from the Bible, but there are still faithful churches that hold to the faith once for all delivered to the saints. As in the days of Elijah, faithful churches may be hard to find, but the standard is simple. Do they hold to the historic biblical faith? Do they declare the whole counsel of God, or just the parts they like? God has given us real churches to help us understand and live out the truths in God's Word. He has given us brothers and sisters to share our burdens and to keep pointing us to Jesus. He has given us elders who are to minister the Word and keep watch over our souls. They are not to lord themselves over the congregation, but to be the chief of servants. Rather than pretending to be new prophets, they are to minister the Scriptures to which they also are accountable. We who truly trust on Jesus are members of a body, and we need one another. Don't let Mormon lies poison you to the truth. Behind their false prophets and apostles are the real ones. Behind their counterfeit Jesus is the genuine. And behind their false church is a true one. You've been lied to so many times, it's easy to overreact. But don't abandon Mormonism for worldliness. Mormonism was simply worldliness masquerading as Christianity. Abandon all worldliness for godliness. The opposite of being in a false church isn't rejecting all churches, but being part of a faithful one. Don't switch from one false prophet to another or try making yourself a prophet. Listen to the true prophets and apostles who point you to the real Jesus. Don't respond to the Mormon counterfeit by rejecting the biblical Jesus. You are doing that already. Embrace the real Jesus. Take up your Bible and read it. Believe on the Jesus you find there and do what he says. In the place of a beautiful lie, we call you to a far more glorious Savior, a Jesus who is worthy of all your trust.